It's about time for us to begin our worship services this morning. We're so glad you're here. And if you're visiting with us, we are really thankful you've come our way and would like to get a record of your attendance. If you'll take a card from the pew in front of you and fill it out, pass that to the aisle. That way we can acknowledge your, your visit today. And if you're a member, of course, we want your uh, to acknowledge your presence as well. So please fill out a card, send that to the aisle. Our young people are on their spring retreat this weekend, so our numbers are a little lower this morning, but uh, be mindful of them. They'll be coming back this afternoon from Taylor Camp. So again, we're thankful that, uh, that you're here. Brother Dave Dawkins is going to lead us in some singing. Get us started. Kind, merciful Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning 
We sing praises to you. We thank you that we have men that can present your word that we can study. Heavenly Father, we ask that we worship you in spirit and in truth and that it's acceptable to you. Heavenly Father, we pray that we'll focus our minds on you this morning shake off the cares of the world. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for Jesus Christ, your son that came and gave his life for us that we can have a hope of eternal life. Heavenly Father, we're mindful this morning the ones that are on our prayer request. We ask that you be with Patricia Baker as she's in the hospital and going through some tough times and we ask that you be with her and Charlie as they, as they go through this, that they look to you for their guidance and their strength. We ask you to be with Marie Brooks, as Jennifer McCarley's grandmother, as she has double pneumonia and that she's fighting that, that you be with the healthcare providers that are attending to her that she can recover. Also, Lord, we pray for Steve McCarley, that's Daniel's dad, that he's facing some heart issues, and we ask that things go well with him, that they can <clears throat> give medication or procedures that will get Steve back to his normal walk of life. Heavenly Father, we're also mindful of all the ones that are on our battling cancer at this time. Be with them as they go through these treatments that is hard on them, that the treatments are successful, that they can have some type of quality of life. Heavenly Father, we also pray for our military men and women is turmoil all over the world. We ask that you be with them and keep them safe, keep them out of harm's way. <clears throat> Help our world and our world leaders to come to some kind of agreement that they don't have to fight. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Steve McCarley. We're thankful for men like him that preach the gospel. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for Daniel as he attends to our youth. Be with him and Jennifer. Heavenly Father, we're also mindful of Scott and Jenny, as they labor here and preach, we're thankful for people like that that dedicate their lives to preaching this gospel. We ask that we be better examples to people that we're around, that they can see Christ in us, that we live in a way that they want to hear about Christ and that we are able to see the opportunities when it's pre presented to ourselves and that we take those opportunities to teach and to preach Christ to a lost and dying world. We ask you to continue with us as we go through the rest of this exercise, this service. Help our hearts to be focused on you, the almighty God, the creator of everything and everyone. It's through your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> This will be fair, a mindful Lord's Supper. There he
I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning, the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. I don't know about you, but the cares of the world sometimes can be heavy. We're bombarded with bad news from all around the world and even our midst. As the song says, when I come here in fellowship and come to Calvary at the cross, those burdens are lifted. Why do we gather here every week? It's just because it's a habit, an example in the New Testament. The communion is a memorial of the bread and the fruit of the vine, and it represents the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It memorializes his death, his burial, and to our victory, his resurrection of our Lord and Messiah. Of course, we do need that to be reminded and to be shaped by this act. Many things influence us through our daily lives. We're bombarded with ads. That stuff brings us happiness, will make us a better person, or more attractive or more uh, appealing to others. We're reminded on TV, the radio, and print ads everywhere you look to make a better you. And we're not really valuable unless we buy their products. Then there's the assumption that we all have rights. And if somebody steps on a right, you know, it's wrong. We're in the right. But then we assume that we're all basically good people because we live in the U.S., a Christian nation. Sometimes that's pretty questionable, isn't it? We stand for justice and morality, and that's what our lives, laws do. For justice, I'm not so much sure about morality anymore. So we stand before God basically good and holy because of that. Not true. The cross reminds us otherwise. It reminds us that the real value of our lives is found in the cross, in Christ's love for us, even while we're enemies. It reminds us that love and not violence it's the only thing that truly frees us. And it reminds us that we're broken individuals before God, deeply sinful and desperate and in need of mercy. And we get that when we come to Calvary and we join in communion with our Lord. If you would, bow with me as we offer thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to gather in your name and remember what you did for us on that day at Calvary. That you gave your blood that we might cleanse us everlasting. All we have to do is accept that and do your will. We ask this morning that we do examine ourselves and discern our bodies and our minds and where our priorities are. And at this time, just toss the cares of our daily lives and the world around us and all the negativism and even all the positivism through material things and focus on your sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Let us do this in a way that will honor you and that will give us a true examination to go forth and do your will. We're most thankful for that sacrifice on that cross and that blood shed on our behalf. And it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen.
If you would, bow with me as we offer thanks for the fruit of the vine. <clears throat> Father, again, additionally, we're thankful for this fruit of the vine. It represents your blood that flowed down on that awful day of persecution. And even though it's so awful, it, it is such a jubilation that it was done for us, that you remembered us yet while we are sinners before we were even in the womb, that you did this for us. Let us examine our body just to understand if we are worthy and go forth into the world and remember that daily and spread that news to others so that they might also have that gift. Again, let us examine our bodies that we are worthy to take this through the vine and memorialize your bleeding on the cross. Again, we're thankful for your son who did that. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. time as a matter of convenience. We'll take up our offering and further the work of this congregation here in our community and around the world. If you'll bow with me. Father, we're truly thankful for those material blessings. And we're especially thankful for those that can help spread your word. We take for granted our blessings sometimes in the material things. We all do like stuff and we understand that's okay if it doesn't become our priority in place of you. Let's truly be thankful for the necessities of life that you provide. And anything over that that we might spread your word around the world so that we can hope for world peace and hope for there to be even more the great jubilation on Judgment Day. We're well, thankful for your son and all he's done for us, and we're thankful for these material things, but let us always be mindful that your son should be our prior. It's in his name that I pray. Amen.
Well, faith does do that. It does give us a sense of security, even when the world seems to be upside down and when challenges seem to be everywhere and we're greatly concerned about this and that and our family and our health, problems with the world around us. Very, very, very good uh, singing this morning, very thoughtful. These words very, very much make me think about how blessed I am. There's something about what Jesus did, uh, Dave, that really makes me want to trust in him and follow him and to uh, stand in amazement in, in the presence of his, uh, his greatness because of what he's done. And uh, how that it just seems like no matter what, to just continue to be um, in the zone the zone of trust, uh, the zone of reliance on, on God, and, and that helps us. Um, man, I really appreciate Marlon's thoughts this morning and Mike's prayer and just everything we've heard today. Um, you know, it could very easily be that we can get into, a, I guess, a habit of doing the things we do on a Sunday morning or doing the things that we do when it comes to taking the Lord's Supper, and, and we just do it because that's what we do, and that's what we've always done, but there's a purpose behind it, and with every, with every partaking of the, of the bread, every partaking of the cup, every time we have the opportunity, we have an opportunity to reflect on what Jesus has done for us, and he has done great things, and he continues to do great things for us. If you look back at his life and you look at how he presented himself to his people, now, you know, miracles aside, even fantastic teaching aside, there was just something about the way that Jesus carried himself. And I think sometimes we, we think that, that godliness is supposed to look a particular way. Sometimes we use the word piety uh, to say that, that piety is supposed to look a particular way. And this morning, I want us to think about godliness in this, this um, I, I guess you could call it, uh, uh, going through the verses of 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 to 7, uh, this uh, series of lessons that we're looking at to try to make our relationship with God more purposeful in all that we do to try to understand these words and to apply these words to our life, it is, it is worthwhile to think about, think about it in view of Jesus. When they saw Jesus, they saw God. They saw Godness. Now, I, 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 undoubtedly, when we talk about seeing Jesus and thinking of his Godness, we, we think about him in his, in his divine nature. We think about him as, as being connected, this man-made word, the Trinity, uh, to define his connection to God. He was with God. He is God, John chapter 1 and verse 1. Beside that, beside the miracles, look at the man. He was godly in all of his pursuits. There was not one self-motivating cell in his body. You, you, you can't get that. And, and, there, and there were times that you see that with the apostles looking at him and the Pharisees looking at him and the people around who are watching him. Sometimes they got the wrong idea. And when they confronted him, he always, always set them on the path of righteousness. Always set them on the path leading them to God. Being like God, connecting with God, seeing God as being this ultimate sense of goodness and greatness and, and, and glory and everything that is right beyond all the things he's done, the creation of the world and all the, the creation of, of everything in it. But just looking at him and thinking, I want to be like that. Marlon, I think that's what you were leaning to and talking about this morning. We have a world that looks good. 
or, or that tries to look good. We try to portray in America this sense of goodness. We still like to think of ourselves as being a God-fearing nation. But sometimes you see some things that are going on even among people who prescribe godliness. And you're left scratching your head. What is it? What is it when God says in passages like Second Corinthians or uh, Peter chapter one five to seven, when he lists things that he says are going to help strengthen supplement our faith, what is he saying about those things? What do we understand when we read those words? For this very reason, he says, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and with virtue, knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. What are we saying here? These are just words, but words convey something. Words convey meaning. And I'd suggest to you this morning, even though he's given a list of nouns, they are all movable by action. They are enhanced by commitment. Commitment that is born out of a sense of awareness, a sense of purposefulness, a sense of saying I'm not just going to know this thing. I'm not just going to try to read about this thing. I'm going to try to be this thing. I'm going to try to be the person that has faith. I'm going to try to be the kind of person that supplements that faith with, with, uh, with virtue and knowledge and, and, and steadfastness and, and self-control and, and godliness. Because without these, what is your faith? It is just an experience. We, we sung the song, we live by faith in Jesus above. What does that mean to you this morning? It has to be, as a part of it, a sense of godliness. This morning, we want to look at some things about this word. Vincent's word studies of the Bible uh, is, says the word for the word for godliness is eusebia. It actually comes from two Greek words. One mean, is you, which means well, and siboamai, uh, to, to be devout, to be devout, and be well in the involvement of it. So he explains it further. It really denotes that piety which characterized by our Godward attitude does that which is well-pleasing to him. My awareness of God, my awareness of Jesus, my awareness of his greatness and his glory makes me want to be like him. Makes me want to characterize myself in such a way that when people go along life's path and they come in contact with me, that they go, you know, there's something different about that person. That person's godly. I think Jesus had this in mind in Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. They're not going to see your good works and glorify you. They're going to see your good works and glorify God. And if God is the epitome of godliness, we've got to be about being like him to the best of our ability. As I was studying this, I came to realize something that we all need to understand is that there are two kinds of godliness. Or maybe you might even say two sides of godliness. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, and Paul actually deals to, with Timothy a lot, talks to Timothy a lot about godliness. He says, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. You ever thought about godliness being kind of a mysterious kind of thing? Well, certainly if you look at the Bible and the theme of the Bible and everything God did throughout the Old Testament, bringing about Jesus and salvation, the church, and all the things in the New Testament, you see godliness. And so he says, great is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh. Who was? God became flesh. 
He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Man, you read that verse and you go, wow, this is a verse about Jesus. But it's a verse about what godliness looks like. It's a verse about what godly or what God wanted the world to know about him. You know, John chapter 14, you know, his disciples are with him in the upper room and they said, well, show us the Father and it suffices you or, or suffices us. And, and of course he responds, how long have I been with you? In that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Not that I am the Father, but you look at me and you see a sense of fatherliness in me. And so it's something they'd never seen before. God in the Old Testament was so misunderstood. They just grappled with whatever they could, could grapple with. They trusted him, but they weren't sure about him. Even though they didn't have any reason to, God was open and he, he, he revealed himself through the patriarchs and he revealed himself through Moses and the law and God was open with this people what, what he had done and what he, how he felt and, and what did he want to supply for people. But somehow, some way, it's almost like they could look at the lines and they'd go, you know, I can't help but read between the lines. You know, we're bad about that, aren't we? It's so easy to read between the lines and to be suspect and, and maybe even challenge God and what he means and what he's doing and, and how he does what he does. It's tempting sometimes. Living this life. Well, you know, the Bible doesn't talk about this, or the Bible doesn't talk about that. You know, I've got this problem, and I, I can't read anything about this problem in my Bible. So, so therefore, you know, God just must mean that he just wants me to kind of do what I see fit. Well, if you read the book of Judges, that last verse there in that book simply says that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Even though God had raised up judge after judge after judge to deliver and God had provided for them and had pro provided and provided and, and, and helped them, helped them, helped them. How much has God helped you this morning? We salute him by desiring, not just to obey him, but desiring to be like him as much as we possibly can. So, two kinds of godliness. The other kind may be best illustrated in Acts chapter three. You remember the occasion where Peter and, and John, the church had just been established. The Bible says, the first 10 or 12 verses, that they go into the temple in the next chapter there. They go into the temple for the purpose of prayer and, and they come up to the gate that, that's called that's called beautiful. Now, there's been a lot of question as to what the beautiful gate really is. Some have said that's in the temple itself, and, and some have said that it's actually the gate on the outside of the walls of the city. And, and uh, e either, either case, there was a place where people would go who were in bad shape, and a family, his family would bring this little lame man to the gate uh, every single day, hoping to get alms, and you know how alms giving kind of takes place, sometimes it's impersonal, sometimes it's just simply the cups out there, and maybe the person's in another world and another thought, but the cup's out there and people come by and they, and they, if they want to drop the coin, they drop the coin into, into the cup. Peter comes by, he sees the man. I don't know if the man's looking at him. I don't know if there's the eye contact. Will he give me the money? Will he put the money in? Peter comes back and he says, I don't have silver and gold. In other words, I don't have a coin to put in, but what I do have will bring glory to God. And he heals this man 
on this occasion. He doesn't, uh, I mean, it's an instantaneous thing. He doesn't uh, massage his legs. He doesn't tell him, take this. And six months, I mean, he produces a miracle right there and then. This man had never walked before, and now he's walking. In fact, not only is he walking, but he's walking well. And the Bible says that he's not only walking well, but he's jumping, and he's leaping, and he's praising God, and he's following the disciples into the temple. And when they come into the area that they call Solomon's porch, they're standing there and the people look and they see Peter, and the, but they also see the, the man that they'd passed. And maybe they had even been some of the people who had dropped the coin in for years. And the Bible says they just stormed them. They just all came close And Peter responds to this coming together by saying, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people utterly astounded ran together to them in the porch called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, it addressed the people, men in Israel, why do you wonder at this? And why do you stare at us as though by our own power and piety we have made him walk? What are you saying, Peter? Why are you looking at us like we had anything to do with this? Why why do you look at me as thinking I'm so something? What Peter is doing on this occasion is what Jesus had tried for three and a half years to teach Peter and the rest of the disciples. And that was, folks, it's not about you. It's about God. It's about living for God. Now, Wednesday nights, we've been going through the book of Mark, and and it's just startling how patient our Savior is trying to get these fishermen and tax collectors and, and, and people who've just so entangled in the world to the point that they need to get so that they recognize that the things they're doing is not for themselves, but the things that they're doing and that they would do is for the glory of God. And so Peter is saying here, look, (laughs) don't look at what I've done or what, what has taken place as being something I've done. It's something definitely that God has done. And then he goes from there and he teaches them about their history and he talks about Abraham and he talks about the gospel, basically the gospel, once again, like he does in chapter two. But what Peter does here for us is he gives us an understanding. There's really two kinds of godliness. It's godliness that comes from me, and it's the godliness that I appeal to, not because of anything that I do or anything about me, but because of what he's done. I trust in him, and I let him. What does godliness look like? I think some people have this idea of godliness, or sometimes we use the piety, kind of the old piety you know, where somebody's walking around in a holy kind of way. You know, I, I don't, you know, some churches, and I, I don't want to make fun of anybody, but some churches have this sense that, that their, 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 their leaders have to be dressed in a certain way to show that they're above. I'm so glad we don't do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to put on a cloak. I don't want to put on anything. I don't want anybody to look at me and say, oh, well, there, you know, there's Brother Scott. I mean, and, and, and folks, I know it's, it's, it's almost humorous in some ways, but in reality, this appeals to our way of life. I can't live my life in such a way that I go around thinking myself better than somebody else because of my faith, because of my trust in God, because of what God has done. It's all about God. I I mean, sure, it's important for you to be here this morning. It's important for your children to be in Bible classes and to you to study the Word. It's important to pray and it's important to dedicate yourself to the Word, but yet... God's done this great thing. And somehow, some way, I have to keep from messing it up by putting myself in it. 
And so when I look at godliness and I think about what God has done, and then I do things for him, not that I can do miracles like Peter could do, but I can do good things. And, and people can look at it and say, well, look what Scott did. No. Never, ever take the credit for godly activity. It's all about God. Godliness can be faked. Three or four verses, five verses that Paul in another passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3 uh, expresses to the young preacher Timothy concerning how people are going to be. And, and, and he says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, or arrogant, abusive, or disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, holy, unholy rather, uh, heartless, una, unappeasing, uh, unappeasable, um, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not, looky, not loving, good, uh, uh, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than the lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but, deny, but denying its power. Here's a question. Can we do godliness without telling anybody? Can I be godly and not draw attention to myself? Can I be godly without saying, look how godly I am? Now, we look at what the writers of the New Testament wrote, and we see their actions, and we see a record of their actions. And somehow, some way, we've got to get, you know, we're, we're blessed by a remembrance of the fact that they did these things. But one of the things that we have to remember is they didn't do these things for themselves. They didn't do themse- these things so that people would look at them and say, look how good they are, look how godly they are. And again, that's how we have to be. There are two parts of God's spiritual provision that actually Peter deals with this in 2 Peter chapter 1 in previous verses. There in 3 and verse 4, he, he tells us about two great things that God has provided for us spiritually. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life, to life. Uh, and to godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and, and excellence by which he has granted to us in his precious and very great promises so that through them you may know or you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that's in the world because of, of sinful deeds. When Jesus died on the cross, he died We remember his death every Lord's Day. How often do you remember his resurrection? You ever notice that we don't have a (laughs) we don't have a special day or a special feast for the resurrection of Jesus? Folks, don't ever don't miss this. It's so important to our discussion of godliness. The resurrection of Jesus is not a once a week kind of remembrance for the Christian. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not something that we do every once in a while. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a daily remembrance. It is a, an hourly remembrance. It's a momentary remembrance. It's an all the time kind of remembrance. Because in his new life, he gave us life. And with it, he gave us godliness. We have a spiritual life and a spiritual hope and a spiritual encouragement in knowing what he's done for us. But with it, he's also given us a sense of godliness. That song we sang a while ago, I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus. The Nazarene, one of those verses, talks about how that he's in the garden and he's praying and he's saying... Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Folks, that's godliness on cloud nine. That's 150% godliness. It's God's way or bust. And that's where Jesus was. And that's why we do stand in amazement.
We can partake of the divine nature. Isn't that an awesome thought? Partaking of a divine nature. And we do that every day. We partake of the Lord's Supper on Sundays. We remember his death on Sundays, but daily in every moment of our lives, we have a chance to partake of his divine nature in the life that we live. Folks, that is godliness if there ever was godliness. That is life if there ever was life. And that's what Jesus came to give us, what God sent him to give us. Godliness has to be pursued. It has to be something that you and I go after, something that we want more than anything. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness. Pursue godliness. Pursue faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Pursue these things. It's something you've got to consciously and be aware of, 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 of going after. Do you think about as you raise your heads off the pillow in the morning, what am I going to do today that approaches godliness, that gets me connected to God, makes me more godly in my life? It may be something you do, uh, but it may have to be something that you pray about, maybe something that you experience and and your relationship when you're reading what God has to say. You know, we talk about the reading and the praying and, and that. And, and, and so when we do these things, they're, they're gifts. They're, they're blessings that come. In fact, they're, it's valuable. It's, it, it, it is beneficial for us to approach it in this way. And he told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 7, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. That's something you ought to train yourself for. Just like these young people right now that are working their cells silly every single day trying to get ready for the Olympics this summer. You know they are dedicated to their cause, working every day to try to be the very best that they can possibly be. It's training. But he says, for bodily training is of some value. Godliness is of value in every way. It holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Because we have set our hope on the living God, that is godliness. And it's something that we do all the time. And how we, how we do that is something that we've got to train ourselves to do. It's something that we have to work daily to do uh, because we know that it's valuable and, and we know there's benefits that, that take place in this present life and in the life to come. We know that God has so many wonderful gifts in store. Something about fellowship, the joy of relationship that is just priceless. When we come together and we, we get together after and, and we go to our classes and and we're talking about the Bible, and we're talking about the Word, and talking about how it's affecting us. These things are so beneficial to us in this life, and they give us hope for the future. Set your hope on the living God. Tonight, I hope you'll be here tonight. We're having a scripture reading and prayer evening this evening, 5.30, and I hope you'll come because our focus is going to be on purposeful hope. Last month, we talked about purposeful faith. This month, we're going to talk about purposeful hope, and we've got several men who, who are already reading scriptures. They're already preparing their prayers, and it's one of the most faith-building, encouraging, most godly things we do here in the congregation. I just, I just really enjoy it, and I, I look forward to being here at 530. So I hope you're here to be a part of that now because it'll, be a, it'll reward you. It, it'll bless you. You'll find it valuable. You'll find it beneficial. Uh, you'll walk away encouraged. Godliness with contentment is great gain. He says in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, if anyone teaches a different doctrine, does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and teaches, and the teaching that accords with godliness, his teaching accords with godliness, he's puffed up and conceited and, and, and understands nothing and constant friction among the people who are depraved in mind and deprived in the, in the truth, imagining that godliness is means of gain. But he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can't take anything out of it. You know, you know something, folks. 
People have reasons for every single thing they do. People do church for a reason. You're doing church this morning for a reason. I don't know your reason. I can't judge your reason. But I do know the motivations that are out here. There are some people who do church, and I think this verse bears it out, because they see some sort of physical gain that's going to come. Maybe recognition, maybe money, maybe some way that somehow, some way, some people might, by my presence there, look at me and say, wow, isn't he awesome, isn't she great? But there's another reason, and that is what true godliness presents, an opportunity to really connect with God and, and, and to strive with all that's in us to try to be better, to be like him, being content with what you have. And sometimes we use those words to talk about money, and I guess it does fit in money, but I think it really fits more here with this idea of being content with the blessings that God has given you and not thinking, i got to try to find something more. See, I think sometimes the people leave the church because they were expecting something more, more than God could give them. And in reality, if they really get plugged into what godliness is, they will, be, they will be provided with riches beyond compare. And they'll walk away and say, you know, it's good enough. It's good enough. And I don't have to have everything. And I, I, I've got God. And if I've got God, I don't need anything else. I can be content. Prayer helps living godly li- lives. 1 Timothy 2 and verses 1 and 2 uh, talk about praying for, uh, making intercession for kings, for people in high positions. And the reason is, is that we might lead peaceable, quiet, and godly lives. I, I want to pursue my godly life. And so I'm going to pray for kings. I'm going to pray for presidents. I'm going to pray for governments. I'm going to pray for strength and, and the wisdom of God to prevail and leadership of, of my nations because I don't want anything to impede me to get in the way of what I'm trying to do for God. So I'm going to pray, God, you just get in there. You, you, you help them. You, you give them wisdom. You, you get it to their heart when nobody else can. Get into their heart and help them to make good choices for what is right and what is good. I think, and this is my last slide, Uh, The end motivates active godliness. Peter, at the end of his letter in chapter 3 and verse 10, talks about the destruction of the world. The world's going to be laid bare, and and we're going to be, and destruction is going to take place. And so he explains here in in verse 11, uh, he says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, he says, what sort of people ought we to be in lives of holiness and godliness? I'm committed this morning that We live a godly life because the end's not pretty for most of the world. The end's not going to be great for the most of mankind. But I want it to be great for me. I want it to be great for mine. I want it to be great for my children and for my grandchildren. I want it to be great for my wife, for for my husband. I I want it to be great even for my employer. I want it to be great for everybody that I'm around. And when I'm godly, I'm going to give every person the best chance to achieve it too. If you're subject to the invitation of our Lord, we invite you to become a child of God. Repent of your sins. Confess Jesus' name. Be baptized the forgiveness of your sins. And if you're away from the Lord, let us pray for you. Restoring godliness is an awesome, awesome thought in your life. Whatever you need, may it, let it be known. While they give us, together we stand as we sing. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. There's a
appreciate you being here. If you're a visitor, you're an honored guest, and we welcome you to come back at any time and ask you to fill out an attendance card and get those passed to the aisles. We'll have some young men coming by to pick those up soon. In the way of prayer requests, Patricia Baker is in Logan Memorial Hospital in room 213. We want to continue to remember her. Marie Brooks, Jennifer McCarley's grandmother, has been battling pneumonia. Uh, so I understand she's now back at home. We want to continue to remember her in our prayers. And Steve McCarley, as was mentioned in the prayer, had a heart cath procedure this past week. He is home recovering from that and doing well. We want to continue to remember those families in our prayers. In the way of announcements, the sewing day for the Magi boxes will be Saturday, April the 20th in the multipurpose room. Uh, the sewing will start at 10 and go until 2. Everything will be furnished. You do not have to know how to sew in order to help. There will be other things to do. Lunch will also be provided. If you have any questions, you can see Mary Lee Brewer, Christine Allen, Joyce Blue, or Linda Maxwell. And they do have sign-up sheets in the hallway and foyer, so they can get an idea for lunch on that. So if you would sign up if you intend to come. Zone D will be hosting a meal for the congregation on Saturday, May the 4th at 1130 in the multipurpose room. Uh, there will be potting flowers for shut-in sick and other special members of our church. If you would like to attend, please see Elmer or Kelly Jenkins. There's also sign-up sheets in the lobby and hallway for that. Our teens are wrapping up their spring retreat. They've had a good weekend, obviously blessed with great weather. Uh, we want to keep them in our prayers as they're traveling back. Uh, it's been a great weekend. They had over 130 people in attendance. Uh, so it's been a good, good weekend for our teens and just... Uh, Thank Daniel for organizing and being a part of that and getting them to that. Pray for their safe travels home. And also congratulations to Lena Price on her baptism from last week. Uh, we still celebrate with her and thankful for that decision she's made and for the six people that have made that decision this month and how exciting that is for us. And, and as mentioned, as Scott mentioned tonight, a scripture and prayer night, scripture reading and prayer night. Uh, we encourage you to come back and be a part of that, and we encourage you to stay for our classes. We have classes for all ages, from babies to adults, uh, so I encourage you to stay for our classes immediately following our dismissal prayer. If you don't know where to go, there'll be somebody at the doors greeting that can, can get you pointed in the right direction. Thank you for being here. Let's all stand, please. After one verse of this song, we'll have a prayer. I am a poor wayfaring stranger. to make us uh, think and to draw us closer to you. And Father, we pray that you would help us as we go throughout our week. Help us to meditate on your word daily. Help us to take it and use it and, and strengthen our faith. And Father, we pray that uh, you would be with us now as we go to our classes. And please be with the Bible class teachers this morning as they have prepared their lessons. And please help them as they uh, go throughout the next hour. Lord, we pray that you would watch over us in all that we do. We pray that you would be with those that were mentioned this morning on our sick list. We pray for their speedy recovery. And Father, we pray that you would help us to seek opportunities, ways to serve. And pray that you would forgive us of our many sins. And thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Good job.